Reluctant Preppers provides educational awareness and commentary only. Opinions expressed do not constitute personalized financial advice. Viewers are encouraged to do their own research and seek qualified personal financial consultation before making investment decisions. Does your family ever get exasperated with you for stockpiling such things as paper towels, bottled water, or toilet tissue? Well, they certainly can't object to you stockpiling money. Silver, the only money recognized by the U.S. Constitution. And your first 10-ounce bar of pure silver can be had at spot price with no premium by going to sdbullion.com rp. And when you buy it that way, you'll be supporting Reluctant Preppers as well by going to sdbullion.com rp. Thanks. Hey, Reluctant Preppers. If you haven't heard, we've already started our monthly one ounce U.S. Silver Eagle thank you gift to one active Patreon subscriber each month, signed by your host, Donegan Kaiser. And you don't want to miss out on that. Please help us grow by subscribing today at patreon.com slash reluctant preppers. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com The people are the sovereigns. The government is simply their agent. They are the creators. It is the creation. Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. It's been a few weeks since we've had this prestigious visitor on. He was wildly popular with our viewers, and they were sharply disappoint disappointed that we had to bring our conversation to an end. We are speaking with Dr. Edwin Vieira, Ph.D., and J.D., who is joining Reluctant Preppers for the second time to break open our roles as free persons, our relationship and proper relationship, right relationship with our government, and our uh, rights, privileges, and obligations under the Constitution Dr. Vieira, thank you for joining us again here on Reluctant Preppers. It's yes, my pleasure to be with you. Yeah. The last time our talk, and for those of you who might have missed it, look it up. It's called Your Second Amendment Rights, Deeper Than You Know, and they go much farther than you've been told with Dr. Edwin Vieira. Uh, we, you gave us quite an exposition of what the, uh, amendment, the Second Amendment is and what it isn't. Uh, what our what the meaning of militia is in that, and how we can find that out, even though it's not defined in the Constitution, but it is elsewhere, and you explain that in great detail. And near the end of our conversation, you are leading us to up to the precipice of who we are as free persons, and what our right relationship is uh, with the government, and what that means about our our sovereignty and our rights and, and responsibilities. And that's where we ran out of time. So if you could. Uh, continue from there, um, maybe you want to wrap just in a nutshell the key points that you made about the Second Amendment um, and then take us further into uh, our rights and responsibilities as free persons. Well, the, the, sec the Second Amendment in encapsulates a great deal of what I call basic political philosophy in America. And remember, that's what we're talking about talking about a political, philosophical heritage in this particular country. Ultimately, some of it, or a fair amount of it, draws from uh, the history of England because the original 13 colonies were, of course, uh, English colonies. If you look at the Second Amendment in abstraction, it's a little bit difficult. You have to put it into context, into the context of the Constitution and then into the context of the earlier document, the underlying foundation for the Constitution, which was, of course, the Declaration of Independence. I could slip in between those two, the Articles of Confederation, to show you the, the general transition that developed, but we can leave that aside for the moment because that just raises what I think are unnecessary or superfluous uh, elements. If you look at the Declaration of Independence, that begins with an exposition of the relationship of people to a government. And basically it teaches that the people themselves are the sovereigns. Governments are simply instruments that are created by the people under certain circumstances in order to protect the set of inalienable rights that people have as a result of, and to quote the Constitution, the laws of nature and of nature's God. And we, if we went into the laws of nature, that is natural law, we're not talking about 
uh, gravity here. We're talking about natural law because that takes you all the way back into uh, the high Middle Ages, perhaps in, in some aspects all the way back to the ancient times. Certainly the Romans uh, talked a great deal about natural law, uh, Cicero being one of the classical expositors of it in the, uh, you know, the late Roman Republic. But those are the basic principles that underlie the powers of the people, the sovereign powers of the people. And according to the Declaration of Independence, the people have an inalienable right to create, alter, abolish governments by delegating to those governments what the Declaration calls just powers. And that's an interesting word, just powers. The people do not have a right to create governments to exercise unjust powers, but only just powers. Then the Declaration goes on to say, well, there may be circumstances in which governments fail in the obligation their duty, their uh, functionality in this respect. And at that point, the people have the right to alter or abolish them and even to create some new form of government that is more appropriate to uh, guarantee those inalienable rights. And that is especially true when a long train of abuses and usurpations indicates that there may be a design among the people in the governmental apparatus to uh, subvert, basically, uh, the principles of natural law and to expose the people to some form of despotism or tyranny. And at that point, the people have the right and the duty to essentially overthrow that form of government and create a new one that is more suitable to the appropriate ends of <clears throat> protection of those inalienable rights. So that's the basic principle. And then, of course, the Declaration goes on to point out that King George III and his ministers were engaged in precisely this long train of abuses and usurpations that were aimed, essentially, at despotism. And then, thirdly, it states the remedy, which is the original 13 colonies declare their independence and say that they are independent, uh, free and independent states with all of the rights pertaining thereto. But you notice at the beginning of the Declaration of Independence, here are these claims, these assertions. The people are the sovereigns. The government is simply their agent. They are the creators. It is the creation. And that if the governmental apparatus, and here we're talking about other people, the public officials, if public officials become rogue, essentially, and the governmental apparatus is misused in order to attempt to establish some form of despotism or tyranny or whatever word you want to use, something that is in uh, opposition to the principles of the laws of nature and of nature's God, then the people have this right and a duty to overthrow that form of government, alter or abolish it in such a way as to achieve the ends that a true government should be achieving. So if you look to the Constitution and the militia concept well, that embodies that basic principle, right? In the Second Amendment, it's made clear, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Well, all right, there are the people exercising through the bearing, keeping and bearing of arms of this function as a militia, a totally armed society which is necessary to the security of free state. Why? Because if the state may, if the state were to be, to become uh, misused, perverted, subverted, whichever word you want to apply, by rogue public officials in a direction other than continuing as a free state, then the militia could come into play to rectify that situation. So there's the positive and, and the negative there. The militia protects this set of circumstances, and if something begins to go wrong through the agency of <laughs> individuals who are you know, attempting to operate, as they say today, on the dark side of the force, uh, then the militia is there to correct that situation. And if you go back to the Constitution, the original Constitution, to which, of course, the Declaration is intimately, uh, excuse me, the Second Amendment is intimately related, what's the first authority and responsibility of the militia for which Congress might call them forth? Well, it's to execute the laws of the Union, right, or the laws of their own states because of the militia are 
uh, state instrumentalities. But at the level of the United States, to execute the laws of the Union. And although most people don't recognize this, it certainly is true that the primary law of the Union was the foundational law of the Union, which was the Declaration of Independence. I mean, you couldn't have had an Articles of Confederation, you couldn't have had a Constitution, you couldn't have a Second Amendment until and unless those original 13 colonies, which were part of the British Empire, had been able, both in fact and in law, to obtain independence. So the principles of the Declaration of Independence flow directly into the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution and the Second Amendment. It is all intimately tied together. Well, then we have to go back to this point in the Declaration of Independence that when certain circumstances arise, the people have the right and the duty and the duty to take certain kinds of actions to correct governmental malfeasance, that is, malfeasance by people in particular public offices. And that, of course, ties into the entire colonial history of what the militia were and how the militia functioned. And the basic principle was that every able-bodied free man had a duty from the time he was usually 16 years old, 15 years old for a while in Massachusetts, but 16 years old, <coughs> which was essentially taken as, at the date, as a date of physical and, let's say, emotional maturity, up to some point in his old age, uh, 50 years old, 55 years old, 60 years old, whatever it was. And <coughs> at, at that point, it was considered that, well, you couldn't impose this kind of a duty on people because they might be physically or mentally incapable of fulfilling it. If they could fulfill it, that was fine. They could always volunteer for those positions. If you look at the history of uh, the militia during the colonial period, during the period of the independent states, for instance, the War of Independence, you'll find many people in the militia who were older than 50, 55, 60 years old, some of the higher-ranking officers, for instance, that was quite typical. Okay. But all of those people were members of this institutional structure with a duty to perform certain functions. Right? If you lived in whatever community it was, or you moved into that community, born in the community, you moved into that community, at a certain point in time, you had a duty to perform this function, to serve in the militia. Whether you were uh, a conscientious objector or not, I mean, take the Quakers, the Mennonites, for instance, uh, there was always some discussion as to what their duty was, and it finally boiled down to, well, they can't be compelled to bear arms because they're pacifists, but they could be compelled to do something else, what we would call what conscientious objectors would do in the modern armed forces. And some of those things, interestingly enough, were perhaps more dangerous than performing a militia function. I think of some statutes that uh, said that the... the Conscientious, what we call conscientious objectors, the Quakers and the Mennonites, they usually singled them out and mentioned particular religions. They said, well, those people don't have to bear arms, but they have to, number one, uh, take the women and the children and the cattle to safety if the community is attacked, or, number two, serve as scouts or spies. Well, in those days, if you were a militiaman and you were captured by the enemy, the French or the Spanish, maybe not the Indians because they didn't, apply the European laws of war, but certainly the French, uh, then you had to be treated as a prisoner of war. If you were caught as a spy, what happened to you? You hanged, all right, or shot. <laughs> Typically, you were hanged, all right? You weren't just kept as a prisoner of war to be exchanged in the normal course of events or when hostilities ended. You were out on the spot if they caught you. You were hanged. Nathan Hale being the classical American example from the War of Independence, right? So those Quakers and, and Mennonites, those conscientious objectors, actually had a duty that perhaps was more, turned out more dangerous to them than simply serving as a regular uh, militiaman. But there was the concept that if you lived in a particular community, and that, of course, was by choice in those days. People had maybe even more freedom of travel than we have today. If you lived in a particular community, the original 13 colonies, then you had to shoulder this responsibility to perform a militia function. And the militia function in those days was, to a very large extent, military or quasi-military. They were trained in order to defend their own communities against 
attacks by uh, hostile Indians, perhaps attacked by the French when there was no uh, British army uh, available to protect them, and to serve as auxiliaries to the regular British army. The classic example of that being the French and Indian War in the middle 1700s, uh, where very large numbers, especially in, in uh, New England, of militiamen served alongside uh, the British army in the fights primarily in uh, northern northern New York. All right, so that was the basis of this. It was a, a fundamental duty to the community. And that, to a large extent, today has been forgotten. I mean, people look at the Bill of Rights and say, well, these are all individual rights. Well, to some extent, they are, especially when you think of something like the Fourth Amendment right against uh, unreasonable searches and seizures, the Fifth Amendment, the right not to uh, incriminate yourself, and Sixth Amendment, right to uh, representation in a criminal context, be being prosecuted. But even if you look at the First Amendment, there's freedom of the press. Well, there's an obligation that goes along with that, too. Freedom of speech is quite, and maybe a classic example because there are limitations on what can be said in certain contexts. You know, the libel laws, defamation, libel and slander, right? Right. Uh, freedom of petition, right? The right to associate to, in order to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Right? Uh, why would you be doing that? Well, it's not, in, if you think of that one right off the bat, you'd say, well, wait a minute. First Amendment, freedom of the press, what's the point of that? Well, it's to inform the population of certain facts, we hope, that will enable the population to take more informed political and social action. Freedom of the press was always looked at as something that had a political aspect to it, a collective aspect to it. And obviously petitioning the government for redress of grievances and associating for that purpose, right? the right to associate, uh, to assemble for that purpose, is a collective right designed to do what? To correct something that's going wrong in the governmental system. You're going to point out something that public officials are doing in an incorrect sense in relationship maybe to the particular laws that have already been enacted or ultimately going back to the principles of the Declaration of Independence. Because you think of the Declaration of Independence, you say, well, that's kind of the first step that would be taken in this process of correcting some improper activity by public officials in the governmental apparatus. The first thing you do is to point this out to them. And if they fail to respond to that, then we go into the Second Amendment context, right? The right to alter, abolish, or take appropriate action to maintain the free state. Okay. But as I say, today everyone is looking at, at these things in an individual sense, and they don't generally connect that, or even recognize there is a connection. Ah, to a okay. Let me see if I can restate that. Okay, okay. So it's not it's a it's a modern misinterpretation of the Bill of Rights to think I have the right to do this, I have the right to do that, I have the right to do that, rather than these rights were established to enable the community of free persons to have the right oversight and uh, intervention to maintain the, uh, the stability and, and the justness of their government that they had created. Yes, <clears throat> and it's, it's more clear in some instances than in others. I mean, as I say, the First Amendment the Second Amendment are pretty clear on that. If you understand, put your, put your mind in the mindset of the people who wrote those documents, what they understood to be their purposes. It doesn't appear as clearly in areas such as the Fourth Amendment or the Fifth Amendment or the Sixth Amendment, but try to imagine a society in which those rights were not being generally protected. What politically would that society look like? Right? So in, in a sense, when you see someone who was being, um, let's say, oppressed in the sense of the, the Fourth Amendment, the sense of the Fifth Amendment, the sense of the Sixth Amendment, that is a wake-up call to everyone else that we have a problem here, right? This government is not being administered in a proper manner. It's, it's attempting to exercise unjust powers, <clears throat> and we, the people, could never have delegated such unjust powers to that government 
And right. therefore, at this point, we have an obligation. We have a right and a duty. Remember, it comes back to that term, the Declaration of Independence. It's not simply a right to alter and abolish or perhaps even overthrow a form of government. It's a right and a duty under certain circumstances to do that. Why? Because the people themselves are the sovereigns here. Under our system of, of government, political science, American political science, it's the people themselves who are the sovereigns. And they exercise a very high responsibility of a collective nature, right? It's to order the community in a certain political and legal manner in order to achieve the effect of having certain kinds of rights and also certain kinds of governmental powers because you need, according to the American political scientific analysis, you need this kind of institution in order to serve these ends. So it's not just that an individual is going to exercise these natural rights. Why? Because he's, he can't do that in society without having some institution to oversee the protection of that exercise. That's the anarchistic problem, right? As soon as you get into anarchy and you have a conflict, an apparent conflict of, of rights, Jones is saying, this is my right, and Smith is saying, no, your right is limited, and actually it's my right to do this. Well, who is going to be the arbiter of that? Who is going to determine in some way, whether it's Jones or it's Smith, and what the boundaries are to those claims of right? And that's mm -hmm. this institution, which is ultimately created to be, <laughs> to use the legal term, the impartial judge. All right? That's the goal. Now, granted, there's a great problem there as a practical matter because the institution is made up of people. It's not made up of you know, artificial intelligence or robots or whatever, or, or of angels. I think uh, Madison says at some point in the Federalist Papers, well, if, if government were made up of men, there would be no problem. Excuse me, if government were made up of angels, there would be no problem. But being ah. made up of men, we have to deal with the problem that you know, men have all sorts of fallibilities. And that's the problem. And at the basic level, the sovereignty of the people has to be exercised by whom? Well, by the people, not by their agents, because their agents may be act, acting in a manner that is uh, an attempt to exercise unjust powers or to exercise just powers in an unjust manner or a faulty manner. And so it, de it devolves back upon the people, the original creators of this institution, to take the responsibility and ultimately to have the authority to correct that situation. Well, in the final analysis, that situation may be one that, be, that can be corrected only by abolishing the particular form. The form of government went bad. All right, it went rotten. They had the uh, mm -hmm. the English system with king and parliament, and for a long time, apparently to the colonists, they were more or less satisfied with it, and then it they come up with this problem of King George III and Lord North and so forth, various ministers that uh, George III had, uh, whose failings, whose elements in the long train of abuses and usurpations are laid out in the Declaration of Independence. And then what's the point? Well, when you have these long train, this long train of uh, abuses and usurpations, it falls back upon the people themselves to correct it. Obviously, the people, the individuals who are exercising these abuses and usurpations are not going to correct themselves. That's the Madisonian problem, right? They're not angels. They're not going to correct themselves. And so the people have to exercise this power. And, that, and where is that power to be located? Well, it has to be located ultimately in force. There's a quote attributed to George Washington, government is not eloquence, government is force. And like fire, it is a useful servant but a dangerous master. I don't know whether he actually said that, but it's attributed to him. But that first point is absolutely correct. Ultimately, government is force. And then the question is, where does the legitimate source of force exist in the community? And under our system of political science, well, it's in the people themselves. And not just the people in some abstract sense, but the armed and organized and trained and disciplined people. Because that's the only type of people that can maintain this kind of a system against a large bureaucratic establishment, which, of course, we've come to develop. And in the days of the Founding Fathers, they considered the British establishment to be that type. A large bureaucratic establishment that sees itself as exercising sovereign powers, did not see itself as an agent of the people, but it sees the people as its instrument. See the difference? Yeah. Right? All right. So the militia concept is, is really saying 
look, folks, if you're going to live in a free society, as the founders understood that, then you have to take on your own shoulders the burden in your own communities of making sure that certain things are done in accordance with basic principles. And that may, in fact, lead to a great deal of inconvenience. Right? You may have to be trained mm -hmm. and disciplined and so forth and so on and go out on a, a, a regular basis and practice certain uh, types of activities. To, and, and today that would today that would be much more than you know the type of martial activities that the militia were involved in during the colonial period. Mm -hmm. But that's the first thing. You'd have this, this level of inconvenience. It might be a level of cost. You might have to provide yourself with uh, certain types of equipment. And then you'd have to be diligent. Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty, right? How many times have we heard that? Mm -hmm. And that's the point, right? You have to be vigilant, and then when that vigilance shows the necessity for action, you have to be ready, willing, and able to take that action. And go back to the colonial period. When you were in the militia, what might have happened to you? Well, you might have been killed. You might have been maimed for life, right, in the course of some military or quasi-military operation, paramilitary operation in some instances, uh, with the French or the, the Indians or later on with the British. But that was your duty. Right? You were not armed and trained in the militia simply to uh, you know, come out on Flag Day or whatever would have, would have been the, you know, the, appropriate, the appropriate holiday and drill on the public green uh, for the uh, you know, visual uh, pleasure of the spectators. The ultimate purpose was you were going to put your, potentially, you were going to put your life on the line in the defense of the community. And so was everyone else in that system. Right? It wasn't just you. We, it wasn't right. a, a volunteer system. It wasn't like our modern army or Marine Corps or whatever, which, not to denigrate them, but they're mercenaries. Right? They're people that are being paid for this. Okay? It's a career in a sense. right? You choose to be in the army or the navy or you don't. And then, you know, you rise higher and higher depending on whether you, whether you like that system or not. And, of course, you're paid and you get all sorts of benefits as a result of it. Uh, the militia was a compulsory organization, still is, in principle, a compulsory organization. It's the only draft organization that the Constitution recognizes. I mean, we have you know, a history, certainly in the 20th century, of various drafts of the First World War and the Second World War and uh, Korean conflict and Vietnam. Right? Uh, and that was not done in the context of the militia. Actually, it couldn't have been, because those were all foreign military adventures. None of them occurred in the United States. Uh, but they what did be, what did become of the militias? We we you've, you've given us a much more insightful. Well, that goes back to yeah. Uh, that goes back picture. to 1903. It goes back to 1903. You know, after the War of Independence, going into the 1830s, let's say, you begin to see in various states, a desire, I would call it a perverse desire, on the part of people not to bear this burden. They were more interested in essentially making money, all right, business, all right, living the private life. And they didn't see any real dangers to their particular communities, whether it was local, state, or or national. And so it becomes harder and harder for the militia to impose what I would call regular institutional discipline. How do we get these people to turn out? How do we get them to have uh, the right equipment? Because the tradition always was that the average person provided, the average militiaman provided his own equipment unless he was too poor and then the, you know, the government would provide the, or the militia would provide the equipment for him. But how do we get the people to do this? Uh, can we find them? And they discovered, well, you know, they can impose fines on paper, but, you know, the sheriffs weren't collecting it or the, the juries weren't granting it or whatever. They were having all sorts of problems. And then, of course, Civil War comes along, and there was a terrific bloodletting. 600,000 Americans died in that conflict. Uh, and at the end of the Civil War, there was something of a revulsion on the part of the general population from you know, military affairs or participation in military affairs. Mm -hmm. And a couple of things happened, one of which was that the militia that still existed 
became what I would call quasi-private institutions. I mean, they were still recognized in one way or another by the state governments and potentially could have been called forth by the government of the United States. But they really were composed primarily of volunteers who had an interest in doing that. I would say maybe playing soldier. And they had a, a large social component and uh, they engaged in many activities that weren't directly related to what you would think would be militia activities. So it was moving away from the general constitutional principle of everyone has a duty, and it became kind of a volunteer uh, operation, looking, of course, for money from the state government or looking for money from the government in Washington to provide various types of equipment. And there were some people in these state militias who very much wanted to become an adjunct of the regular army. They were in there because, in the militia because they were, not to denigrate, they wanted to play soldier, right? the citizen soldier concept. They had you know, their normal civilian life, but then on the weekends and a couple of weeks during the summer, they wanted to train as soldiers. <clears throat> and the army, or the people in the defense establishment in, in Washington, D.C. at least, looked at this and said, well, that's not such a bad idea if we can organize it in such a way as to keep it under centralized control. And they do this in 1903. There's a statute called the Dick Act, which repeals the previous Militia Act, which is an act from 1792, the original Militia Act. And it creates what we now know as the National Guard. That's the first time that term is used in relationship to the militia. And it says that there are two components to the militia. The organized militia, which he calls the National Guard, and there's another component called the Naval Militia, which created a few years later. And then everybody else goes to what was originally called the Reserve Militia, and then shortly thereafter was called what is now called the Unorganized Militia. So they've taken the militia by statute, and they've divided it into an active component called the Organized Militia, which is the National Guard. And then everybody else is dumped into this unorganized and basically inactive category called the unorganized militia. And then slowly but surely you see the development of the statutes of the National Guard becoming closer and closer as an adjunct to the regular army. So you ask yourself the question, well, how do you justify this constitutionally? And the first problem is, well, of course, you can't justify an unorganized militia. There's no such thing historically. There, there weren't two militias back during the colonial period, the period of the independent states, uh, an organized one and then a large bunch of people in you know, an organized militia. A anyone who was eligible for the militia, and that was a question of your age and your ability, was part of an organized operation. So what is this thing supposed to be? Well, that, that seems, that tells me that what the politicians in 1903 did was essentially disestablish the militia. And they created this other thing called the National Guard. And the difficulty with the National Guard is that it is and becomes an adjunct of the regular army. Or the Air Force, you have an Air National Guard. Or the Navy, you have a naval a militia, so-called, but it's much smaller than the, than the National Guard. And that's the reason that you see the National Guard as early as 1916. There's a statute, National Defense Act of 1916, which makes this connection and then Shortly thereafter, in 1917, where does the National Guard end up going? Well, to France, right? World War I. This came just in time for World War I, the deployment of Americans overseas to fight in foreign wars. And then, of course, you have World War II. National Guard was highly involved in that. Uh, the Korean War, National Guard hi highly involved in that in one form or another. The Vietnamese War, or the Vietnamese conflict that wasn't a declared war. Uh, once again. So you ask yourself, what is this thing called the National Guard? Well, it's not a militia. It actually comes under Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3, which states that no state without the consent of Congress shall keep troops or ships in time of peace. Uh, this was designed to prevent the states from maintaining state armies or state navies. If you go back to the period of the War of Independence, you did have those three categories. There was the Continental Army, which was controlled by the Continental Congress. That was the kind of the egg 
out of which came the Constitution. And then you had state armies and navies, literally. And then you had the militia. So there were these three forms of uh, martial establishment. Regular army at the national level, a state army at the state level, and then the militia at the state level. And what does Congress do, or excuse me, what does the Constitution do? It says, well, Congress can raise and support armies and provide and maintain a navy. Okay, that goes back to the colonial period. And, of course, the states have the militia. That's on the other side. That's the other end of this uh, equation. States have the militia, and the militia can be called forth by Congress to serve certain purposes. And where are these state armies and navies that existed? Well, that's Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3. No state shall keep these things in time of war without the consent of Congress. So what happened in the beginning in 1903, Congress and the states made a deal, and there was mutual consent that they would take these things that were in existence and were calling themselves militia from the post-Civil War period mm -hmm. and make them into a thing that it called the National Guard, which had a very fixed statutory relationship to the Army. And everybody else would just be shunted off to Nowhereville, if you will. So you are a member of the unorganized militia, probably. Probably most of the people that are listening to this are members of the unorganized militia. What do you do in that capacity? Well, basically nothing. You have no particular duties. You have no training. You have no discipline. You have no governance. You don't come out once a month or once a year or once every five years to perform some kind of militia function that would remind you, as a, at a minimum, of the duty that you have to guarantee the security of a free state. You're just there in, you know, in, in the shadows. Now, if you look at the state statutes, typically speaking, they will say something along the line of, the unorganized militia consists of everyone who isn't in the National Guard or the Naval Militia. And the governor, under some circumstances, and it will list half a dozen types of emergencies, could call out the unorganized militia, call out the members of the unorganized militia. Right. And here in Virginia, we have that. But the question then arises, well, assume we had one of these emergencies and the governor acted on the basis of this statute that gives him this authority, what would happen? And the answer is, well, nobody knows. They're, I mean, I, I'm sitting here, and I, I, I've looked at this for a long time. I said, well, what would he do? What would the governor do? Would he send people around with bullhorns and pickup trucks, you know, telling us to come out? And do what? Well, we have no training. We have no equipment. We have no organization. We have nothing. So what would be the use of this? And the answer is, well, there'd be no use except to deceive people. That someone like myself who looks, starts looking at this and says, oh, well, yes, the unorganized militia still exists, or the militia still exists in this unorganized form, and therefore they're complying with the Constitution. Well, of course, they're not complying with the Constitution. And the reason this was done, the subterranean reason, the ulterior motive, 1903, you have to remember that this was a period in which uh, what's now often called technocracy was arising in the area of, of politics in the United States. Uh, a lot of, especially in the economic field, a lot of American economists had gone over to uh, Imperial Germany at the time, and they looked at the Bismarck system and so forth, some of the other systems that had been set up in, in Europe. And they said, this is a great idea. We, what we need to have are experts running our government. The people are really not capable of running the government. And you stop right there and you say, wait a minute, that's contrary to the whole principle of our government. Mm -hmm. right? The people of the sovereigns are the ones who are supposed to be running the government. We assume, we presume conclusively that the people have this ability because that's essentially what the Declaration tells us. They have this ability and they're going to exercise this power and this right and this duty. But the, the technocrats said people really are incapable of governing themselves, other perhaps than choosing representatives. So what we really need is to set up what are now called administrative agencies, expert agencies of bureaucrats, and Congress would create these through statute, and Congress would fund these agencies, and the bureaucrats, being the experts, would then decide what needed to be done through a process of writing regulations. And the role of the people in this process would be very simple, twofold, they would elect the representatives who would appropriate the funds, create the agencies and appropriate the funds so the agencies could run the country, and the people would pay the taxes 
in order to fund this. And otherwise, they should just keep quiet and not really participate in government at all. And that ties in very well with the concept of eliminating the real constitutional militia. Because if you have that kind of a system, a technocratic system, the last thing you want to have is a large population of armed and trained people who see themselves as the real governors of the system. You want the people to be passive. You want the people to be inactive. The last thing you want the people to think that they have the authority to do is to enforce some higher level political principles and legal principles on public officials, especially the public officials in the bureaucracy, in the permanent government, if you will. These people are not elected. They're just there, and they're, they have careers that span you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 years. Today called what? The deep state, the shadow government. That's right. Hear that, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and that's, of course, talking about these bureaucracies in a negative way. All right. The technocrats didn't look at it. The technocrats thought that they were doing good, right? Because they were the smartest people in the world, so they knew how to handle this. But the other side of that was, if they're the smartest people in the world, you're not as smart as they are, and therefore you should be excluded from real control in this system. Well, that's contrary to the, the concept of. Declaration of Independence, concept of the Constitution itself, certainly the concept in the Second Amendment. So you see, following this process of asserting technocracy, at least at the level of the government of Washington, D.C., they begin to institute what we call gun control laws. 1934, you have limitations on uh, automatic fire weapons, uh, short-barreled rifles and shotguns, what are now called destructive devices. I mean, the list of things, silencers, suppressors, and so forth. Uh, 1930, was it 1939, they begin the process of licensing gun dealers. Uh, by the time you get 1968, there's a lot of that going on in various states. 1968, there's the so-called Gun Control Act of 1968, which creates the whole system that we now have of federal firearms licensees, whether they're gunsmiths or gun manufacturers or gun retailers, or whatever, they all have to be licensed. <clears throat> and certain requirements on uh, purchase and sale of different types of firearms to different types of people under different types of circumstances. And we've seen other things since then. There was the so-called assault rifles, uh, assault weapons ban mm-hmm. under Clinton. And all of these things, if you add them up, they are all designed to take as many arms away from as many people in as many circumstances as possible, as quickly as possible. That's the goal. And therefore, they are directly contradictory of the Second Amendment concept. They're directly contradictory of the militia concept of the Constitution. They're directly contradictory of the ultimate principle of popular sovereignty in the Declaration of Independence. Because, and here I have to quote Mao Zedong, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. And basically, that's an underlying principle, although he certainly was no Democrat, (laughs) obviously. certainly didn't believe in a Republican form of government. But it's a a fundamental concept that the sovereign is the body in society, whether it's simply the king or, on the other side, the people as a whole, who exercise the ultimate level of force. They are the governors because they are capable, through the exercise of force, of bringing those uh, contradictory elements that are found in society into line whether for good, we hope, or possibly for ill. And so the technocratic movement, if you will, uh, wanted as much as possible to remove the people from what I would call day-to-day participation, direct participation in government. And one pretty good way of doing that, if you understand this system, is to, uh, what should I say, negate the real existence of the militia. Because elections mm-hmm. come every two, four, six years at the at the federal level, right? House of Representatives every two years, president every four years, senators they're every six years because they're rotating them, right? Uh, what happens in between? During that two-year period or four-year period or six-year period with a particular senator, a great deal of harm can be done by those representatives, and what is the check and balance? And remember, the, the, the great genius of this system, as 
expressed by Madison over and over again was the concept of checks and balances. Checks and balances at every level. Checks and balances within the government at the national level. Checks and balances within the government at the state level. Checks and balances between the states and the national government. And then ultimately, if you look at the Tenth Amendment, that check and balance involving the people as against the states, as against the government in Washington, D.C. Right? So that check and balance system has to operate between elections, because a great deal of damage can be done between elections. Right. And the whole concept of the militia function was people were going to be in a position to have the ability, because they were trained and they were armed and they were disciplined and they were organized, to take appropriate action when their vigilance told them that some action had to be taken because they were facing some train of abuses and usurpations, which might not be as long as the one that went on with King George III. That was from what, the 1760s until the late 17th, yeah, late 1760s, mid 1760s, stamp back somewhere up until mm -hmm. 1776. So you were talking about 10, 10, 15 years of abuses and usurpations. It might be a lot less. You might have abuses and usurpations that were so bad in a year or two years that you wanted to take immediate action. Well, that's fine, uh, but vigilance without capability is essentially useless. All right, you can complain, but you can't really act. And also, number two, the average person, this is what gets back to the concept of the individual versus the, the, the collective right in the Second Amendment. The ab average individual does not have particular legal authority to take certain kinds of actions. I mean, it, under the common law, there's mm -hmm. a concept of a, you know, of a citizen's arrest. And you hear some people talking about those things today, or citizen's grand jury. I mean, they always... Uh, the adjective is always citizen, citizen something, all right? And you ask yourself, well, yes, in some kind of principle, maybe you can make a citizen's arrest of a public official who's engaged in unconstitutional action, but you know how far that's going to get you because mm -hmm. you're simply an individual and you have the prosecutors after you, you have the police after you immediately, and you have the prosecutors after you pretty quickly thereafter. There is no recognized institution, and I say that in a practical manner because, of course, the Constitution recognizes it. There is no recognized institution in which the people directly act as the counterweight, as the check and balance against rogue public officialdom, whether it's at the local level or at the town or the county or it's at the state level, or certainly it's the level of the government of Washington, D.C., and especially the so-called deep state that's huge bureaucracy within the government of Washington, D.C. And that, I think, was accomplished intentionally. Because if you look at the militia concept, it is one that is directed to a lot of protective elements. Because the security of a free state in the Second Amendment does not have an asterisk following it, saying, well, here's how we're going to define security. And it's just these one, two, three, four, five categories of action. It's everything that may relate to the maintenance of a free state. And that could be military, it could be economic, it could ultimately may perhaps be even uh, cultural, certainly political. Right? Think of something as simple as honest elections, right? where the vote is honestly counted. You don't have dead people voting in Chicago. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, one would think, well, you couldn't have a free state very long, at least it wouldn't be secure, if all of the elections were subject to fraud. Obviously, right? So one would think, well, there's an area where you would want to have a militia structure because a militia structure involves everyone in the community. You can involve everyone in the community in a process of keeping vigilant and actually performing certain functions to make sure that the only people who voted in your precinct were people who were entitled to vote. And they weren't entitled to vote three or four times, you know, go from your precinct to another precinct. So on and, so on. and that would be very easy to accomplish if you had a militia structure. But what would it do? Well, it would prevent a lot of vote fraud. And, of course, the, <laughs> the political parties in this country are favorable to vote fraud, at least if it works in their favor, right? I mean, mm -hmm. anyone who says that this country is not replete with vote fraud hasn't been paying attention mm -hmm. to the voting system. But the militia would stop that, all right? So there's an example. Well, the powers that be, don't want that kind of day-to-day -day interference by an organized and trained structure of average citizens who have and recognize their political authority to supervise and intervene in these areas. 
They want the, the, the technocrats, if you will, the, the, I use that word in the broad sense, the technocrats want government to be under their control without any influence from the people. They don't recognize the people as the sovereigns. I mean, that's very simple. The people are subjects, and perhaps even more uh, in that sense than they were to King George III. You're here to vote for representatives, and that's a, uh, essentially a sham process, a fraudulent process, and in many instances a completely dishonest process, because they'll tell you one thing and then they'll do another thing as soon as they're elected, or maybe they're elected through vote fraud or whatever. But that, you're, you're there to do that, and then you're there to pay taxes, to finance this system, if it can't be financed through debt, through the Federal Reserve, right? which is becoming more obvious is the only way it can be financed. Uh, and otherwise, uh, otherwise, otherwise you ought to shut up and do what you're told. And that's it. And you really have no authority to challenge this system. Now, I say challenge, but that's not all that a militia would do. I mean, a militia structure would enforce, if you will, execute the laws within the system. And I give you the example. I'd like to give you the example of the Bundy Ranch. You know what I'm talking about, the business that went out in I Nevada? Do. Yep, and we've got a video people can refer to on that topic specifically called Does the Government Own Your Land? That's, and that's right. on our channel yeah. as well. That, that's a big question. That's a very big question. But let's assume for the moment, just for purposes of argument, that the, the, the government of Washington is entitled to own certain land in Nevada. And we would hope that you know, in the future they're going to dispossess themselves of that and turn it over to the states or whatever. But th th let's just assume for the moment they're entitled to use some of that. And that the Bureau of Land Management is a legitimate agency to deal with lands that the federal government legitimately owns. And it can legitimately create certain regulations with respect to those lands. And uh, Mr. Bundy or whoever has the use of those lands at the present time. And so the BLM comes up with some particular regulation that um, Mr. Bundy or the people using that land have a problem with. Uh, who's going to execute that? Well, you, we know what happened, right? They sent out a bunch of SWAT people, mm -hmm. sent out a, a bunch of armed thugs from the federal government to a, attempt to enforce these regulations. Now, under the constitutional structure, I would say, well, the best way to deal with this bureaucracy, assuming purposes of argument that it can't exist, would be to have the militia execute those regulations. Right? If we're assuming the regulations are legitimate under the Constitution, they're laws. Well, the militia un uh, executes those, and the value of that would be, number one, the militia are the people who actually live out there with Clive and Bundy. <laughs> they're the local folks, right? It's done by the militia in those local communities. That's right. They have some idea of what the real situation is. They have some sympathy, probably a large amount of sympathy, for the local people involved. They are going to be vigilant and wary of something coming out of Washington that may be uh, excessive, let's say, that may go beyond what's legitimate for the people in Washington to, to do. And so you're going to run into an immediate check and balance situation. And I take in this particular one, the people in Washington send something down to the um, – County lieutenant, he would be the head of the militia, and say, well, you have a responsibility to execute. We've got a you know, congressional statute that gives us responsibility to execute the laws in this area to the militia. And here's our regulation. We need to do this. We need to apply this to Bundy and to the pe people like Bundy. And the county lieutenant uh, writes back and says, well, you know, I have a problem with this. We have a problem with this here. We don't think that you're ex executing uh, your authority correctly in Washington. And we need to talk about it before we're going to execute this against the Bundys. Now, that's a very, in a sense, oversimplified vision of what I would call a check and balance in here, because these kinds of negotiations would be going on all the time. But, there but would it's be a just the perspective, that's right, it's just the perspective back to the constitutional basis, and it, and it retained the power uh, with the people and at the local level. Um, I hate to say this, it's been a, a, another intriguing hour, I can't believe that we, we and another hour has passed, and uh, the clock is against us here, but if we can uh, pick this up on our next episode and uh, look with, with your help into without the current militia system, how do we regain our constitutional footing and how do people reclaim their sovereignty as the creators and right relationship with their government? Um, we've been speaking with Dr. Edwin Vieira, constitutional scholar. Today is 
Thursday, November 8th, 2018. Dr. Vieira, uh, if you have a parting thought for our guests before we, uh, for our audience, before we have to let you go. Well, what I would say is that the last thing that you mentioned is the problem that we are now facing. This is not theoretical. It's coming to the fore. Exactly how do we do this without a presently organized militia structure? Right. And we're going to be facing that. I think there's no question. This is not, what we're talking about here is not theoretical. Not at all. Every uh, scenario that you have laid out has come to play, and you've, you've talked about how our uh, proper uh, rights and uh, even role under the Constitution has been basically uh, dismantled and withdrawn from the people, and uh, partly with, with our own cooperation or complicity, and, uh, and how we reverse that will be the topic of our next uh, visit with you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Vieira, thank you uh, gratefully for joining us here on Reluctant Preppers. Well, thank you very much. 